let's continue with polycythemia <clears throat> this is still under anemia although the condition results in an excessive increase in the number of red blood cells um, by the way it's not just an increase in red blood cells but this will also include an increased number of platelets as well as white blood cells so it falls under anemia because these red blood cells that the body in this patient's bone marrow is producing are not normal red blood cells by not normal i mean they're unable to um, carry oxygen like normal red blood cells do as well as they also differ in the lifespan so they're immature um, you know pretty much useless uh, red blood cells so they're they're not going to have the regular 120 day life lifespan of a normal red blood cell so the main problem that result is if your if your bloodstream is now flooded with a lot of red blood cells a lot of platelets and a lot of white blood cells so we have a problem with increased blood viscosity so that will trigger a hypercoagulable condition if you look at a varicose triad polycythemia was listed under hypercoagulability because of the the blood here becomes so thick and as a result the blood volume increases so the patient's main symptoms or problems here are hypertension and uh, increase susceptibility to uh, clotting there are two forms we have primary and secondary um, primary it's usually because of uh, a defect in the you know uh, it's a genetic problem the patient is born with the with the disorder in secondary obviously this is acquired some uh, conditions in, uh, that can trigger the uh, development of secondary polycythemia are the following and you've probably seen this also happen although not polycythemia vera but polycythemia in itself was mentioned as a compensation in patients with COPD right that's why COPD patients appear pink okay but however the polycythemia in COPD that wasn't polycythemia vera because at least in that condition as a when it's um, a compensation from COPD from chronic hypoxia at least those red blood cells are normal okay they have the normal lifespan they function normally however uh, the polycythemia we're talking about here is a um, it's it's a blood disorder meaning um, if you really look at it it's it, this is actually a form of cancer that's why you also see in the in the management this is also treated with uh, chemotherapy but not IV chemotherapy manifestations like I said the patient has anemia so the patient will have um, symptoms of anemia as well as hypertension and there will be ev evidence of clotting so here are your patient's complaints sorry I zoomed in and then lost the page okay so other manifestations are paresthesias uh, the patient also has like I said uh, evidence of clotting so there will be some occlusive vascular occlusive um, symptoms um, causing intermittent claudication when a clot you know ends up in a peripheral artery then it causes claudication um, and evidence of thrombophlebitis so the thrombosis here could cause anything it could be a PE a stroke an MI other manifestations are related to because the red these blood cells are again abnormal they uh, die you know sooner than normal cells blood cells would 
So there will be some liver and spleen engorgement. So the patient will have more cell dead cells being circulated in the spleen, enlarging the organ. And uh, since these um, are cells nonetheless, so every time cells die or they, they uh, are lysed, you know, when they go into lysis, when they die, of course, they, they spill out their contents. Uh, dead cells typically, or dead or damaged cells typically uh, release uric acid, causing symptoms of gout. Diagnostic studies, of course, we do a blood count and then get a sample of the bone marrow showing the uh, abnormal uh, stem cells producing these uh, abnormal blood cells. Treatment. The cheapest treatment is phlebotomy. Now, this is not like we're getting uh, a little bit of blood at a time. These are a lot of blood. The patient will have 300 to 500 ml of blood removed every other day until the hematocrit is below back to normal. So the goal is this, we want to maintain a hematocrit of less than 45% and 42% uh, respectively in men and women. Uh, others are because the patient has anemia and because of the increased destruction of the red blood cells because they're not they don't have a normal lifespan so we give the patient iron supplements because there will be some uh, low iron here because there is increased destruction of your red blood cells hydration is very important to reduce the clotting um, as this will reduce the blood viscosity as a result the patient at home you know will be told to increase iv flu i mean uh, po intake of fluids or well, in the hospital then it would be PON IV hydration. This is the chemo drug they'll use. This is PO. Uh, as far as decreasing the likelihood of clotting episodes, uh, we will use uh, baby aspirin. There is really no recommendation for anti uh, anticoagulation here. So uh, it is all a combination of hydration and aspirin and again treatment will be hydroxyurea and of course symptomatic treatment of the gouty symptoms will be allopurinol and that will be repeated here in the nursing management so again we uh, emphasize to the patient hydration therapy and watch out for signs and symptoms of clotting and um, here we um, tell them the consequences of um, not getting enough water intake or fluid intake will have um, clotting consequences so it's important that the patient is aware of that so in between episodes though the patient will have to receive the phlebotomy so they'll and that's a lot of blood so they'll they'll return to the hospital to get 300 to 500 ml every other day until the hematocrit goes back to normal another option would be which is more expensive is uh, plasma i mean um, apheresis so the patient will need a shunt for that procedure although that's not mentioned here in your textbook um, it is a an option but um, it's rather expensive apheresis plus it won't be that simple to be done because the patient will have a shunt just like a patient undergoing dialysis because pretty much that's what's going to be happen although it's not going to be a dialysis machine but rather an apheresis machine so uh, just like in dialysis they'll put in two needles in the patient's arm one needle will get the blood out into the apheresis machine while in there the blood, I mean the machine will remove the excess red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets and then return the blood back to the patient in the other needle. And that's it for polycythemia. Next are the thrombocytopenic episodes. There are a few. We will only discuss 
ITP, TTP, HIT, and DIC. Only those four. I will skip hemophilia because that is more of a, a pediatric disease, although I'm not saying it doesn't occur. I mean, I'm not saying that the patients won't grow old, uh, but this is a more suited under um, pediatrics, uh, pediatric topic. Thrombocytopenia by definition is a reduction of your platelet count. So our normal platelet count is between 150 to 400,000 micro, uh, per microliter. These are the four that we will discuss. These are other causes of thrombocytopenia. Let's begin with ITP. This is also called idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, uh, but the new term is immune thrombocytopenic purpura. By the term itself, idiopathic or immune, this is regarded as an autoimmune dis uh, disorder. Your patients develop a antibody against their own platelets. So the uh, patient's uh, immune system fails to recognize the platelets as normal, but uh, the opposite happens. So they are tagged as uh, foreign bodies, so therefore are attacked. So this is the main reason why the platelet count drops because the, the, patient is, um, the patient's immune system is destroying them. And because of the destruction, the manifestations, of course, it will cause um, enlargement of the spleen again and because your platelet count is low then you will have a patient with bleeding signs and symptoms. The lab results will be uh, displayed later in the chapter. Um, you know what let's go to it now. Okay, So we'll periodically refer to table 30-12 for the exam, I will only be asking you common lab findings. Okay, we uh, only the ones I highlighted on table 30-12. The reason is we're not using this table to diagnose the patient, but rather it's important for the nurse to recognize them because you're the first again at the at the bedside, so you're the only one there 24 hours a day. So we look at the plate uh, plate patient's blood re lab results every morning. Okay, every shift actually. So if you're working night shift, it may be available at the end of your shift. Or if you're morning shift, this will be the first thing you see. So when you see the lab results, then it's important that you recognize what's happening and then you then notify the physician promptly. So for the exam, let's start with ITP. So uh, we will test platelets, hemoglobin count, PT, PTT, and D-dimer. So PT and PTT are your bleeding times or your clotting times, rather. Um, D-dimer is a uh, fibrin degradation or a fibrin split product, meaning these are what's left over after a, a clot is formed. Okay. Okay, so let's see what happens in ITP. So again, the patient here develops an antibody against their own platelets. So they are destroyed at a higher rate. So that, that's why when you look at the labs in table 30-12, so here is ITP, platelet count drops. Hemoglobin, however, is normal, although there will be bleeding. Uh, so in that instance, if there is spontaneous bleeding, meaning the platelet count drops below 10,000 or below 20,000, uh, that's the point where you start having spontaneous bleeding, then that's the only time your hemoglobin will drop. However, only the platelets are affected here. There is really no effect on the clotting factors. There's no uh, destruction or um, there's no effect on your clotting factors. However, um, the patient is uh, bleeding here. So since there are no 
clots form so therefore your D-dimer is normal. Again, D-dimer is only present if you have clots because at the end of the clotting cascade from the extrinsic to the intrinsic pathway, when a clot is formed, the next step is a clot lysis, meaning after a, blood, a fibrin clot is formed, then the body starts to break down that clot. Let's go now to TTP. So in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, this is still a, a thrombocytopenic disorder. The problem here is uh, genetic. The patient has a deficiency of ADAMS13. This is a, a plasma enzyme. Now, this is important in order to um, So here, again, the, um, the patient lacks a plasma enzyme known as ADAMS13. Uh, ADAMS so this is important in order to um, prevent uh, too much clotting. Okay? So if you have a deficiency of this, so therefore there, you will have an increased tendency to clot. And once you have an uh, increased clotting, which is now going to activate platelets more and more, you end up losing or using up all your platelets. So this is the reason why the platelet count drops. So again, the in in uh, in in um, simple terms, the patient develops clotting inappropriately. So the patient clots for no reason, meaning there is no need for, for the body to clot, there is no endothelial injury, there is no venous stasis, there is no hypercoagulable episode. The patient simply lacks this enzyme. So because of that deficiency, the patient now clots inappropriately. Ironically also, because of that process that's going on, when the patient therefore has an injury, for instance, or has a, a, a need to clot, so let's say sustains a needle prick injury uh, during hospitalization, you know, you draw blood, they cannot stop that bleeding anymore because they're running out of platelets, okay, because all of them already aggregated and form clots. The patient to treat this will be treated with uh, chemotherapy. So these are the drugs that are used um, this can develop in almost anyone, okay? um, not necessarily uh, pre present at birth, but uh, it may develop later. Okay? But um, when they do that, uh, each episode, uh, when, when it develops, is treated as a medical emergency. We'll discuss management uh, later. Let's go now to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So this is the third thrombocytopenic episode. So what happens here is, in the first place, heparin is a indirect thrombin inhibitor. We give it to patients who are admitted for stroke, an MI, or a pulmonary embolus, right? So those are the patients that we treat for anticoagulation to prevent clots from forming. What happens here is the patient, upon exposure to heparin, develops thrombocytopenia. How that occurs is the patient forms a, a, um, an antibody against uh, heparin. So the patient, a platelet normally produces this factor. No, not that one. This one, platelet factor 4. So every activated platelet produces this. And once this is produced, it will further activate more platelets. Okay. And, and those activated platelets will make more platelet factor 4. And then the more platelet factor 4s are released, then more um, platelets will be activated. So you have really um, a, a large number of activated um, platelets here now all ready to form a clot. Now what happens is the, um, 
the heparin forms a complex with platelet factor 4. So they attach to heparin, platelet factor 4 attaches to heparin, and when it does that, it becomes a foreign body, meaning the, the patient's immune system no longer recognizes that complex. Okay, so again, when the platelet factor 4 released by the activated platelets form a complex with heparin, it is now recognized as a foreign body and therefore when they reach the spleen, they will be targeted for removal. They will be eaten by your uh, macrophages. Okay, so here again, like I said, so the, so the more heparin your, your patient receives, then the more PF4 heparin complexes are formed. And then now you have a positive feedback, meaning you're caught in a um, vicious cycle here. So more complexes are formed, then more platelets are activated, and more platelets activated, they perform, they, they produce more platelet factor force, which bind to more heparin. Okay, and then you have a vicious cycle there, a positive feedback loop. So therefore, once identified, the first action would be to stop the heparin because the more heparin molecules enter the patient, then the more of these complexes are formed. So you have two problems here. First is you are forming blood clots because of the complex that is formed and then you have more platelets that are activated. However, because this causes thrombocytopenia as a result, so now you also have a bleeding problem. Manifestations will, will therefore show both. The patient will have signs of clotting while at the same time are at risk for bleeding. So you'll have these signs here. So you have petechia, purpura, ecchymosis on the skin. And then as a result, your major complication is hemorrhage. And signs and symptoms of hemorrhage are, of course, no weakness, fainting, dizziness, abdominal pain, hypotension. How do we diagnose it? <clears throat> now, there are two types of uh, HIT here. Um, the more common type is going to have an onset of 5 to 10 days right here after exposure to heparin. Right here, so this is where you see a 50% drop of heparin, I mean of platelets, sorry. Again, the, the, the most common type is the thrombocytopenia occurs about 5 to 10 days after onset of heparin therapy. The reason for this is the body normally takes about one week to form antibodies. So this is why upon exposure to heparin, the platelet drop which happens here doesn't happen until about five to ten days because your body hasn't developed these antibodies yet so that's why there's a delay in the development so, so the the platelets that are activated and forming clots which will now use up all the platelets doesn't happen until five to ten days the cue here is a 50 percent drop which for some people might not uh, actually be noticed right away because let's say this patient comes in with a platelet count of 400,000 or more. If it falls by 50%, that will only bring the platelet count to 200,000, which is actually still normal because on your lab results, when you check your labs, the numbers don't turn red or become bolded until it, it falls below normal. Now, since the in the example I gave, uh, wherein the patient came in with 400,000 and when then was given heparin, and then over the next few days, the platelet dropped to 200,000, technically 200,000 is not abnormal. It's still normal. But because of the huge drop, then that is suspicious for HIT. The other type is HIT can also develop right away within the first 24 hours of using heparin can also um, happen. In those patients, the reason is they've been exposed to heparin before on a possibly on a previous admission. So let's say I'm admitted today 
and then I got heparin for whatever reason. Okay, so it could be DVT prophylaxis, okay? But I didn't stay long enough in the hospital. So I probably got one or two doses of heparin maybe and then I was discharged. So I won't manifest the symptoms right now. And uh, since the heparin uh, exposure stopped, you know, I was discharged, I no longer received heparin. So I went home, but all the while, after my first exposure to heparin, I already had developed the antibodies. However, since I didn't get another dose of heparin, so that's why I was spared of the disorder. However, the next time I, I get admitted to the hospital or the next time I receive heparin, now I have antibodies against the, uh, against the heparin from a previous exposure. So that's in those types of patients, you'll see HIT develop right away as opposed to five to 10 days. Okay, let's go now to, oh, I forgot to show you the TP, TTP. Okay, um, let's do HIT first. Uh, HIT, so the problem is the patient develops um, a, um, no, and the heparin develops a, uh, no, uh, the body, the patient develops a complex, um, which is platelet factor four, forms a complex with heparin. And then now that is identified as a foreign object, so the patient develops antibodies against that complex. And so therefore, uh, not only are the patient forming blood clots as the complexes are formed, they are also being uh, platelets, therefore, that have it uh, are being destroyed in the spleen. So my platelet count drops by at least 50% or more. However, uh, again, because of the um, there might not be bleeding right away. Uh, hemoglobin may be normal, um, not until the platelet count really drops um, dangerously low, just like what happened in ITP. Also, it only affects platelets, so therefore no effects on clotting factors. My PT and PTT will be normal. However, because I was forming clots, the platelet factor 4 was forming a complex with platelets, so therefore I was forming blood clots, so the patient's D-dimer levels will rise. Again, D-dimer is a fibrin split product. It is formed after a blood clot is, uh, a fibrin clot is formed. So uh, once a fibrin clot is formed, again, the body tries to dissolve the clot, break down fibrin, and uh, the remaining product after you break down fibrin is the dimer. Uh, I'll back up to TTP. I apologize. So here is TTP. So the patient here has a deficiency of this enzyme, correct? So they therefore have a hyper tendency to form blood clots in the presence of uh, a uh, trigger, meaning there's no need to clot, but then the patient is developing clots for no reason. So the platelet count drops. However, uh, if the patient sustains an injury or a needle prick, for instance, since they don't have any more platelets left because they all were formed, were forming clots, then the patient has bleeding. So if you see the table 30-12 under TTP, the platelet count drops. Because you are now uh, in a dangerously low uh, platelet count, there will be now bleeding leading to low hemoglobin and um, however um, again it only affects platelets not the clotting factor so your bleeding time is still normal um, however because you're now forming clots you have a increase in the d-dimer let's go now to DIC Uh, before that, let's look at the um, management first. Okay, so here's management for ITP. Uh, this is autoimmune and you're developing antibodies against your own platelets. So it is treated with uh, any other immune disorder. So you're given corticosteroids. 
okay, to suppress your immune system so that it stops developing antibodies against your platelets. Um, more autoimmune treatment is IBIG. Okay, that will do the same thing. Splenectomy may be indicated if uh, those uh, therapies above are um, I mean the patient doesn't respond to uh, chemotherapy I mean sorry uh, immunosuppression um, because the spleen plays a part here because you know your spleen is uh, where your white blood cells congregate um, and they destroy um, blood cells in, in the spleen so uh, splenectomy may help And that's it. Let's go now to okay. Um, uh, platelet transfusions. Uh, platelet transfusions is used in ITP um, if the platelet count is now less than ten thousand. So this is the cutoff. Um, platelets are not routinely transfused. Uh, unless the platelet count is actually below 10,000. The reason is platelets do not live long. So if you transfuse too soon, your platelets may not be around anymore by the time uh, you really need it. Because, uh, again, because of that sh very short um, lifespan of platelets, they're only alive for about a week, 8 to 10 days. Now, uh, so should let's say the platelet count is still 20,000 or 50,000 and then you uh, transfuse it so you're just wasting the platelets so because by the time the platelet count drops then the platelet that you transfuse are already gone they all they've already uh, outlived their um, their use okay uh, or their life their, their lifespan TTP so treatment here is a, a drug, or you can also do plasma exchange. Uh, plasma exchange means uh, plasma pheresis. Um, the patient, uh, the, remember the problem in TTP is you developed anti. Um, uh, there was a deficiency in Adams thirteen, right? So the patient clots. Um, uh, what is this um, inappropriately okay forming clots so we will uh, give a plasma exchange uh, to remove the um, plasma and plasma contains remember plasma contains your antibodies uh, contains um, yeah white blood cells and your um, immune system cells are in your plasma so we need to remove them and then exchange with uh, in exchange for another plasma or just normal saline if that doesn't work we'll also add steroids to the treatment um, splenectomy may be also be considered now you notice that there is no mention of um, platelet transfusion here okay so this is the reason here okay so administration of platelets is contraindicated because this this may lead to new complexes and therefore will only increase clotting so it's not it's not going to be um, indicated right it, it doesn't make sense HIT like I said the trigger here is because of heparin so every time the patient receives heparin, they've already developed antibodies against it. So therefore, there will be platelet factor four um, complexes forming with the with the patient's platelets. So and then what causes that? What caused that in the first place was the presence of heparin. So therefore, your first action, of course, is to stop all heparin. And I mean no heparin, whether it's unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. 
However, since the patient was admitted for anticoagulation, right? That's why we, we gave them heparin in the first place. Now, they still need anticoagulation. So therefore, since heparin is now contraindicated because apparently they developed an antibody against it, so now we should use direct thrombin inhibitors now to maintain anticoagulation. The most uh, commonly used replacement is ergotrobin. There are others like Arixtra, for instance. These are non-heparin anticoagulants, uh, so those would be used. Um, warfarin is considered only if your platelet count is back to normal. And of course, don't forget to put heparin as a allergy on these patients now. You should never be given heparin anymore. Uh, and that's right there. Okay. All right, so let's go to nursing management. So whether the patient has ITP, TTP, HIT, uh, or later uh, has DIC, thrombocytopenia management is the same. So we have table 13, uh, 30 15. This is your um, best practice and teaching for a patient with thrombocytopenia. So they include all bleeding precautions and watching for signs of bleeding. These are your signs of bleeding. So please prepare to. Um, see those or the uh, equivalent on the test questions so these are uh, avoiding trauma okay maintaining safety especially to your feet no you don't want the patient falling do not blow your nose forcefully so that means they can blow their nose okay they just can't blow it forcefully um, in, the, in the event that they get a nosebleed, that's what you do. Um, if the bleeding doesn't stop, call the doctor after 10 minutes. So these activities increase intracranial pressure. So we do not, um, we discourage those activities because you might have a brain bleed. Uh, stay hydrated, no rectal trauma so this would uh, include uh, no suppositories no enemas no rectal temperature measurements and that would also include no um, anal intercourse okay. um, shave only with an electric razor uh, no tweezing avoid unnecessary punctures to your skin and avoid drugs that promote bleeding. So that would be NSAIDs or aspirin. Soft whistle toothbrush, we know that. Um, here, when, when menstruating, track the how many pads. This is a frequent question when they present to the ER. The triage nurse will ask, you know, how many pads have you used or how many tampons, for instance, if they use tampons. But once they start bleeding, there should be just like you don't put anything up in your rectum, then also don't put anything up the patient's vagina. And again, avoid any unnecessary invasive procedures. All right, and we did this in table 30-12. We look at platelet count, coagulation studies, RPT, PTT and we watch the hemoglobin All right so just pay attention to these in 30-12 for each one uh, we'll go back to it when we discuss um, DIC okay DIC is next I already said we will uh, skip hemophilia let's go to DIC all right uh, one thing to emphasize here is what I highlighted here. DIC is not a disease. It results from a number of conditions listed in Table 30-9, which is on the next page. So this can occur in acute, catastrophic condition, or it may also exist in chronic conditions. So the most common causes of DIC, Table 30-19, are the following 
the most common are the first few bullets shock all the way to cancer oh let's include these also okay so these are the common causes of DIC shock because shock is a severe injury uh, specifically septic shock or septicemia um, it doesn't have to wait until the patient is in septic shock before DIC occurs because DIC starts at the severe sepsis stage and gets full-blown once the patient is already in septic shock I'm sure this was mentioned when you when you studied uh, septic shock so there were several stages in uh, septic shock so we started with local infection to early sepsis and then to the SIRS stage and then we had severe sepsis and then septic shock so if you review that the microthrombi formation which is the early stages of DIC happened during the severe sepsis stage another serious injury is uh, hemolytic reaction which is transfusion of mismatched blood um, or any other cause of hemolysis um, traumatic conditions bleeding conditions like uh, abruptio placenta because the patient there could hemorrhage same thing for uh, septic abortion and then the help syndrome which was discussed in ob this stands for um, elevated liver um, enzymes and then low platelets and I forgot what H stood for anyway that's uh, under OB so and malignancies if you remember in chapter 15 um, although I'm not sure if chapter 15 included sepsis as the one of the oncologic emergencies but it is uh, that was based on the fact that patients with cancer have a decreased immune system correct either from the cancer itself like leukemia for instance where's leukemia um, oh right here so so let's say in the case of leukemia where the patient has a high number of um, non-functioning white blood cells therefore they cannot protect themselves they are they are at risk for several infections um, since the patient with cancer has that or even not only as a result of the cancer but because of the treatment remember chemotherapy causes myelosuppression or bone marrow suppression as well as radiation therapy also uh, developed uh, or can cause myelosuppression or bone marrow suppression so that is in that uh, sense that the patient with cancer first develops sepsis or severe infection and then they go into DIC so it is a sepsis and DIC are part of the oncologic emergencies all right let's go now to how did the well, how did uh, DIC develop okay so now we have oh i remember now the h here is hemolysis in um, help syndrome okay in in the cases mentioned above here in table 30-19 the causes here for dic so let's take one for instance uh, let's take either hemorrhage or cancer it's easy to see in hemorrhagic episodes so let's say in uh, abruptio placenta or any other severe injury like severe burns severe head injury transplant rejections in any of these cases there is some extent of endothelial injury here so there was damage or injury to the blood vessel and if you remember the uh, clotting cascade in chapter 29 the uh, injured vessels will produce tissue factor so once a capillary an artery or a vein is um, injured then it will trigger the clotting cascade so here comes the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway if you need a review of the clotting cascade please go back to 
the lecture on DBT, which was chapter 37, I believe. Okay, so in the case of cancer, however, there is no tissue factor release from a vessel injury. So in the in the case of cancer in um, in malignant causes, the cancer cells themselves produce tissue factor in the absence of injury. So again, unlike the most of the conditions here which lead to endothelial injury or vessel injury, in cancer there is no there is not necessarily a vessel injury here, but it it is the cancer cells themselves producing the tissue factor. Again, the tissue factor is the trigger for your clotting cascade. So long story short, you have a tissue factor in the extrinsic phase will attract platelets, causing platelets to uh, adhere to the site of injury and then form a temporary plug. Meanwhile, in the intrinsic, intrinsic pathway, you have a uh, a cascade of clotting factor activation so clotting factor 7 for instance um, um, activates 8 9 and so on then they meet at factor 10a and then uh, at that point once factor 10a is activated it forms a uh, complex with prothrombin thereby forming thrombin and then once you have uh, thrombin it will now form fibrin and then therefore you have a stable clot so the fibrin will adhere to the temporary plug formed at the extrinsic pathway strengthening that uh, that temporary uh, platelet plug so now you have a strong stable clot right after that though once that is formed now we have fibrinolysis so here after you form the um, the thrombi now you have fibrinolysis so uh, the body starts to break down the fibrin now and so therefore every fibrin that is broken down or destroyed by the body you will have FDPs FDPs is your D dimer so this is now the reason why your D dimer is high because it came from breakdown of the fibrin here Okay, so, and this is what happens to DIC. Uh, let's put it here now. So, you had all those conditions there, the uh, hemorrhagic conditions, the abruptus placenta, the cancer. First event occurs is the thrombus part. So, the because you have clot, clotting cascade activation, the body uh, uses up a lot of clots. Unlike in the thrombocytopenic episodes wherein they were only affecting platelets. This one goes beyond platelets because this now affects the intrin intrinsic pathway. So clotting factors here are also used. So you have a consumption on one side of platelets leading to thrombocytopenia, while at the same time you have there in the intrinsic pathway the activation of uh, clotting factors causing the the consumption of uh, clotting factors to form thrombin so after the clotting episode wherein you had a large number of these clots form using up all the platelets using up all your coagulation factors bleeding follows right so again the DIC has two phases here a clotting phase and then a longer bleeding phase so the clotting phase in DIC is it's shorter compared to the bleeding stage. There is acute and chronic DIC, uh, but we don't worry about the chronic because this one won't you won't be uh, an emergency. It's really the acute type that will cause massive bleeding here. Okay, uh, so please read this um, this um, this paragraph here and this one if this helps explain um, the pathophysiology or the mechanism of the development or the um, the 
sequence of events that lead to the bleeding in DIC. So again, the patient in DIC has a clotting and then a bleeding phase. So you will see both um, at different times. But the more obvious uh, observations will be toward the, the bleeding phase now because like I said the clotting phase is not as long as the bleeding part so by the time you really see DIC the patient is already bleeding so most of your symptoms here are um, toward bleeding uh, rather than clotting so you'll have here maybe on number one the patient has um, well actually these are all bleeding now Okay, so these are all evidence of bleeding. Let's go to the lab back to 30-12 and see what the patient in the IC um, will look like um, as far as their lab studies are concerned. So let's look at 30-12. Okay, oh, no, that's not it. Okay, here it is. So this last column is DIC. So look at the platelets. Platelets in DIC drops. Um, uh, the hemoglobin depends. If you catch it during the clotting phase, then hemoglobin is normal. But once you're in the bleeding phase now, it definitely will be low. Let's look at your PT and PTT. They, of course, will be high because now not only platelets are, are affected here, we're talking about the clotting factors at the same time. So because you had a clotting phase wherein you had a massive consumption of your clotting factors and platelets forming blood clots and of course the body will dissolve every blood clot so that's why your D-dimer here is elevated I hope that helps okay let's go now to as far as management my only comment with DIC is um, now here's another I didn't really need to go to 30-12 there's there's also less a list here in 30-20 but it should be the same so here your PTPTT is prolonged um, you have platelets drop you have your D dimers very high uh, D dimer and FSP that is those are the same uh, here fibrinogen is reduced because fibrinogen is your um, the um, the you know the, the thing that formed the clot uh, so if platelets are dropped then so is that but all look at all your bleeding times okay they're all prolonged or your clotting time sorry so the the patient is bleeding here because uh, it takes a long time for you to clot okay management it's easier said than done but I can say is the sooner you recognize DIC then the better the prognosis once DIC unfortunately is uh, diagnosed then the patient um, could considerably be bleeding already uh, DIC has a very high mortality if caught early, um, you can give anticoagulants, you know, right here. So you can give anticoagulants if you're still in the clotting phase. And then once we enter the bleeding phase now, you reverse. So no more heparin, then you go into um, stopping the, um, the bleeding now. So fresh frozen plasma is rich in clotting factors because that's your plasma so that will be given along with red blood cell or even platelet transfusions because the patient here is uh, bleeding quite extensively
and that's it okay we already discussed the uh, the management of a bleeding patient we, we discussed it earlier the um, you know no rectal trauma avoid unnecessary venipunctures um, what else uh, use a um, soft bristle toothbrush and all that avoid you know um, blowing your nose forcefully and all that now let's go to neutropenia so we did anemia and then thrombocytopenia now this is the last part neutropenia so the definition is if your total blood cell white blood cell count is low however since the neutrophils are your true measure of your immune system's ability to protect you uh, we base it on your absolute neutrophil count this is also the same uh, measure we did in um, in HIV if you have already talked about HIV in a previous semester so this is simply multiplying by I mean your total WC count WBC count by the percentage of your neutrophils so you obviously need a w, uh, CBC with differential count here in order to um, calculate your ANC on a lab result in the hospital it's already calculated for you but uh, like I said it's very easy to uh, multiply so you you simply just let's say you have 20,000 total platelets and then you multiply that by the uh, percentage of your neutrophils because they are broken down into percentage and that's your ANC so that's your absolute neutrophil count there are many causes of neutropenia uh, mostly cancers it's also drugs so look at these you saw these drugs in cancer so chemotherapeutic agents cause neutropenia because they cause myelosuppression these are the other drugs and we have um, disorders of the of the blood uh, especially the bone marrow we also have autoimmune disorders, lupus, or rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. Now, very important to note, just like what we did in cancer, these patients have a really suppressed immune system. So they do not have a normal immune or even an inflammatory response. <clears throat> so that's why, as we mentioned in chapter 15, we don't need a really high fever in order to indicate um, that the patient is already having a uh, infection okay so in fact here look at this bullet neutropenic fever uh, is already a uh, medical emergency so don't wait for this to reach 101 before you are alarmed again uh, in any neutropenic patient a low-grade fever like this is already a medical, a medical emergency, meaning they already have a severe infection at that point. The infections they develop here are called opportunistic infections, just like the patient in HIV. So basically, um, the the level of neutropenia that these patients have are the same as those of a uh, patient with HIV or AIDS okay they are that susceptible to uh, they are the very definition of a susceptible host because look at these infections causative organisms here we typically are um, uh, not you know um, affected by uh, viruses you know the, the common cold unless you are really you know uh, your, your immune system is weak but for these patients yeah these things can kill them uh, typically uh, they develop um, uh, shingles okay so, so this is the reactivation of your the chicken pox that you had as a child then you develop uh, shingles Okay, diagnostic purposes we simply do your ANC and that's how we make a diagnosis that you have neutropenia we simply calculate your ANC all right so <clears throat> management this is 30-22 
All right, we treat the uh, cause of the neutropenia. Uh, emphasis is on uh, if possible, because sometimes, of course, these are not, because let's say you're receiving treatment for cancer, we can't stop the, the treatment. Although when infection is present, then the patient pretty much uh, cannot receive any more or cannot continue with the treatment. So in those cases, so yeah. Um, but for others, let's say in HIV or lupus, then we cannot remove the cause. Okay, those are chronic um, conditions with no cure. Okay, we start antibiotics. Uh, we culture, of course, before we give the first dose of antibiotics. Uh, not only blood cultures, okay? So if the doctor order, orders any culture, so that includes... Um, urine culture a wound if the patient has a wound uh, or even a swab okay nasal swab so whatever the doctor orders take all those specimens uh, samples first before you start the antibiotics here is filgrastim we uh, covered this in chapter 15 so this is for the uh, increased production of your to stim stimulate the bone marrow to produce more white blood cells uh, I don't have to say this, that's important. Um, and I did mention um, cleaning or washing, especially the um, high, high risk areas like your, your underarms and your perineum. Okay, very important places to wash. Remember, these patients may not only have neutropenia, they may have uh, anemia at the same time. Okay, so um, hygiene is uh, very good. So if they can't do a full shower, then at least wash those high-risk areas. Okay, and do a frequent mouth care also. Okay. Um, this is the explanation of the table we just um, we just read. Here's the antibiotics, and there's the culture there, monitoring temperature. Here's the cultures, and here's field grass then. Okay. Um, here's another one. The, uh, the patient here, the frequent cause of infection are the patient's own normal flora. Um, others, there should be a table right here. Okay, table 30-23. So this is now for the patient and the caregiver. So here's universal precautions. Um, on top of this though, you should also institute reverse isolation or we call it uh, neutropenic precautions, meaning instead of the patient being the one uh, infectious, you know, we don't call we we don't put the patient on contact precaution, but we put them on neutropenic precaution. So instead of them being infectious to us, we are the ones who are infectious to the patient. So we know this already. Um, watch them for common sources of infection or signs of infection. Uh, avoid crowds. Okay, uh, wear a mask definitely and um, good hygiene uh, no uncooked meats or seafood so no sushi no um, um, salads uh, subway sandwiches you know because they have cheeses which uh, are not cooked um, no subway sandwiches therefore okay so because they, they have some uncooked meats there in the deli um, Here's the hygiene. Uh, another thing is no gardening, and also uh, pets, especially if you're uh, you have cats, so you can't uh, change the cat litter. Um, another thing is if you don't have, you, if you can't have the uh, uncooked meats or unwashed fruits and vegetables. Uh, also, no fresh flowers because the flowers there could carry something so if you want to visit just you know maybe give a card or plastic flowers which you can wash um, also recommendations are fruits that are hard to wash like strawberries for instance or, or um, blackberries okay those have really tiny ridges which are impossible to to wash we don't know what are in there 
so all these by the way this diet is called a low bacteria diet meaning uh, foods that um, you know the only things you serve this patient must be uh, close to zero bacteria as much as possible reptiles are also not good pets to have because uh, they are known to carry salmonella so uh, dogs and cats if you have them then but definitely do not change the litter box by yourself um, moving down here my questions won't be specific to the um, disorders because most of these disorders are cancer blood cancer so we already did management of a patient who has cancer in chapter 51 and also management of patients receiving surgery chemotherapy and radiation therapy for cancer so i won't have specific questions about the disorder itself namely let's say myelodysplastic syndrome or any of the leukemias and lymphomas okay i'll, I'll spare you that um, all you need to know is a patient with myelodysplastic syndromes patient with leukemia any type of leukemia or any type of lymphoma are all neutropenic patients so you practice the care written here in table what table was that 30-23 okay so again for a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome um, this will also uh, include multiple myeloma okay because that is again a, a bone marrow problem uh, leukemia definitely bone marrow disease uh, lymphomas which is a uh, disorder of your lymphatic system namely these are tumors that arise from your lymph nodes which is part of your immune system all these patients have neutropenia but it's also important to remember that just because it says neutropenia doesn't mean that's your only problem remember these patients have a problem in the bone marrow so although the um, clinical features are those affecting the white blood cells but keep in mind they arise from the same bone marrow where your red blood cells and your platelets are also produced so therefore if you have a defective lymphocytic stem cell there they will therefore you know um, multiply rapidly so they can in turn box out or crowd out the entire bone marrow leaving less production of your normal myelogenic or myeloid stem cells so think of it this way so you have a lot of you have a lot more of these defective white blood cells because that's their uh, that's the characteristic of any cancer right they develop rapidly and they develop aggressively so because their multiplication or their cell division rate is so much higher than those of the normal uh, stem cells in the in the same bone marrow so therefore the patient here with leukemia um, multiple myeloma lymphoma or uh, myelodysplastic syndromes all have pancytopenia meaning on top of the neutropenia they will also have anemia and thrombocytopenia as far as stem cell transplantation goes we already discussed this during the discussion in chapter 15 so these are lymphomas again i have nothing specific for the disorder uh, whether hodgkin's non-hodgkin's lymphoma it's really the nursing care and then the nursing care here is again caring for a patient who is neutropenic caring for a patient who has anemia and caring for a patient with thrombocytopenia so here's multiple myeloma again same thing uh, let me just make sure i covered everything Or even spleen disorders again spleen is um, part of your immune system so therefore it will result in uh, immunosuppression as well all right so here comes the blood transfusion table 30-31 
this is these are the blood products um, testable you need to know the indication okay so what are the use for packed red blood cells okay and what are your nursing responsibilities same thing for platelets okay and then pay particular attention about the indicate I mean when the threshold is which was mentioned under ITP that uh, platelet transfusions aren't done until the patient's platelet count is under 10,000 the exception there is even if the patient's platelet count is still let's say 50,000 but then the patient is actively bleeding though then we of course we don't wait until the platelet count is under 10,000 because by the time we draw blood and then we see that the platelet count is already under 10,000 the, and then that, and then that's the time we um, infuse the platelets it may be too late because the whole time the patient is already bleeding okay. all right um, although this is now the blood transfusion procedure although this one says 22 gauge here um, nobody does this okay um, although if you don't have one so let's say you have a really um, a patient with a really bad IV access meaning you can't find a vein that will fit a 20 because you need at least a 20 gauge in order to safely transfuse any blood product um, just get an order for a 22 because uh, the 22 is forcing it meaning I'm sure the blood cell can squeeze through it but you're you're asking too much of the red blood cells now you're asking them to you know okay just squeeze in there be flexible okay uh, I mean it, it will infuse but um, you're risking damage to the red blood cells so so here it says here however large sizes are preferred okay the only solution we use is of course only normal saline do not use any other fluids so when we infuse I mean we prime the blood tubing it should only be primed with normal saline all right, so let's describe the procedure. So you got an order, doctor wrote an order for transfusion. He says type and cross uh, one or two units, let's say, of packed red blood cells. And then um, he orders to transfuse. So he may have a, a condition, let's say transfuse, if hemoglobin drops below eight grams per deciliter, then that's the condition. All right, so the first thing you do is ask for consent because if the patient refuses the blood transfusion, then we don't need to proceed with the type and crossing and wasting a, uh, a blood product, you know, uh, unnecessarily because no. the patient refused anyway. So once you get the, okay, once you get the consent, then you can proceed with preparing your equipment. So you got the consent and then you confirm with the blood bank that they're working on it all right so meanwhile it, it'll take uh, one to two hours before they get the blood thawed cross matched and um, ready for transfusion so meanwhile you can do your pre-assessments you do your questions on the patient and you do your ed education uh, and then once done then you can set up your equipment so now you have your uh, IV pump and then we get your blood administration set you can hang a bag of saline and then you can prime the tubing with saline once ready then you just follow up by that time the blood bank should call you and say okay your blood is ready for once um, who can you send to get the bag the blood of bag of blood so it can be a CNA can be the clerk so you don't have to go take it yourself it, it's fine um, there should be a uh, right here so here is your delegation because we assume that you're you're a busy nurse okay so here is the UAP so UAP can obtain the blood from the blood bank 
okay you just need they just need the patient's sticker you know information and then match it there that way they know that you're taking the correct blood for the correct patient all right <clears throat> um does the same uap can also take vital signs before the transfusion and after the first 15 minutes let me explain this so you have the patient ready and since they haven't received the blood yet so you can take the vital signs before so it doesn't have to be you because nothing's happening to the patient so this is only your baseline vital signs before the transfusion started so this blood uh, this set of vital signs can be taken by the uap now once the blood has started and you're staying with the patient for the first 15 minutes the first 15 minute vital signs will be done by the RN because that is part of your evaluation for a sign of transfusion reaction okay since it's stated here that uh, most uh, transfusion reactions occur during the first 15 minutes right here so uh, during the first 15 minutes or the first 50 ml of blood most transfusions occur during that time so therefore, the first 15 minute vital signs must be done by the RN. However, once that, if that blood uh, set of vital signs are, are stable, meaning no change from your pre-transfusion vital signs, then you can delegate the other vital signs after the first 15 minutes because it will differ from institution to institution how often we will check the vital signs some institutions have you check the vital signs every 30 minutes some uh, uh, every hour or whatever other frequency um, your institution has okay so again if the patient's vital signs are stable after the first 15 minutes which the rn evaluated right here then the rest of them can be delegated to the UAP. You just need to be specific when you delegate about what changes, what particular changes you want them to report to you. Okay, so uh, you sent the CNA to get your blood and now you have the blood now. They brought it back to you uh, in a timely manner. So now comes, you have to check whether it's uh, the correct blood. So first thing is to do compatibility. So uh, study this, table 30-32. Um, for the exam though, I'll make it a little easier for you. I will not give you an own, an, a patient with a RH negative blood. So on the exam, all your patients will have an RH positive blood. All right, so you don't have to, because there's some differences here, it, it gets a little complicated if there is an RH negative patient. So for the exam, um, will be uh, all your patients will have an RH positive uh, blood type, okay? All right, so we determined that the patient's blood matches to the blood that the a blood bank sent you because it won't be the exact type all the time so let's say look at this if your patient is AB positive this is a very rare blood type so if they're out of it they don't have enough donors for it the the blood bank may send you an O positive all right so that's what I mean by you, you have to check because uh, it, it won't be an, a perfect match all the time now you have a need a second person in order to check it with you so that second person is right here an lpn because the procedure here tells you that with a any licensed professional uh, can check the blood with you okay and uh, the lpn happens to be a licensed professional they took the nclex pn so they have a license they can check the blood with you However, they can only do that, check with you. They cannot hang the blood or administer the blood for you. Okay, so the uh, administration has to be done with uh, by, by the RN. So here, double check with another licensed nurse. 
Okay, so that licensed nurse can be this LPN. So we check the blood, so we're ready. So now we got consent earlier, so we already educated the patient. We have a set of vital signs ready, so now we hang the blood. We hang the blood and the nurse has to stay with the patient during the first 15 minutes. And if there are reactions, which we'll talk about next, uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, what your manage is for each uh, transfusion reaction, if any occurs. Uh, never or do not infuse PRBCs quickly unless it's an emergency. But um, routine blood, transfusion uh, blood transfusions are not emergency. So you just infuse them at a rate that makes sure your um, pack RBCs are infused no longer than four hours. However, that four hours is counted from the time that the blood left the blood bank meaning when the cna got it from the blood bank until you finish the transfusion it should be no longer than four hours so since you lose time from the time from the moment the the cna got it to to you know when they rode the elevator to come they find you and then you found uh, somebody to check blood with you and then set it up so maybe you lose around 30 minutes or more okay so take that into account plus you also have to account for delays so let's say this patient gets up go to the bathroom or your IV access goes bad so you have to change another one so uh, take all those into account don't put it too close to the four hour limit so after the first 15 minutes it's safe to transfuse the blood at a rate because uh, a bag of blood contains about 300 ml so you should infuse it at least at 100 mLs per hour. Or you can go higher at around 120 mLs per hour. That's also good. Again, that we don't want to cut it too close. If for any reason the blood isn't started right away, meaning you're, it, it, you, you don't hang it within 30 minutes, so now you will be short on time. So it's best that you return that blood. We can still save that for next time. So just return it, we'll put it back in the right uh, temperature storage. Um, you do not put it in your in the refrigerator in your nursing unit. Okay, that's not the optimum temperature for storing blood. It's, it should only be in the blood bank. <clears throat> so uh, let's say no, you know, nothing uh, happened. The patient uh, finished the transfusion, then very good. So here it is, it should not take more than four hours uh, to transfuse a unit of packed red blood cells, okay? So this one is acceptable, two hours or a little over two hours, especially if the patient is elderly, you don't wanna give the transfusion too fast. Let's go now to reactions, okay? So table 30-33 contains the description of each the signs and symptoms, and then what you do about it, what your first actions are, and uh, any subse subsequent actions, if any. So, first is an acute hemolytic reaction. So this is quite rare because look at the cause, it's ABO incompatibility. A lot of people already checked it, the blood bank did, you did, so uh, it really takes a lot of people to make mistakes before this thing happens but in the case if it happens then these are the patient's manifestations all right and it is deadly you just looked at the um, DIC uh, this was one of the causes of DIC an acute hemolytic reaction which is uh, you know hemolysis of blood cells increased destruction of red blood cells which can trigger um, kidney injury because you now you have hemoglobinuria um, it can cause shock and, and kidney damage and DIC so take your pick here so a patient dies from shock cardiac arrest any one of these can kill the patient but if it happens of course um, what we do is stop the transfusion and then treat each one good luck with the treatment because the patient you, you have to call rapid response here uh, they'll be given lots of fluids um, 
and then treat each complication that arises um, individually. So we give uh, fluids for shock, um, do ACLS for the cardiac arrest, uh, defibrillate if they go into PFib, VTAP, and manage the IC. Okay. Now you would hope you know it, it never happens to you. There's a lot of paperwork involved, and of course your patient dies. Febrile is the most common, uh, non-hemolytic, okay? Because we do have fever up here in um, hemolytic reaction. We have fever and chills. So this one is a low-grade fever. <clears throat> now this is common in patients who have developed, I mean who have received prior blood transfusions. So the more blood transfusions the patient has had in their history, then uh, the higher the chance of having a febrile reaction. It's not always um, serious, okay, as long as it's a non-hemolytic reaction. So these are the patient's symptoms. And uh, here is um, your management. So um, you have to stop the transfusion though, because you, your cue there, although it doesn't say here that you stop, but since here, look at the second bullet, it says do not restart. So that means you had to stop it in order for you to restart. So the action is to stop it, report it to the doctor. Most likely the doctor will give you this order. All right, so we give time, uh, um, Tylenol and then restart. Okay, uh, but you have to get an order. Doctor will tell you, okay, continue the transfusion. Prevention here, you could have prevent, uh, avoided it if the doctor gave you a um, uh, Tylenol before or uh, Benadryl before the transfusion started 30 minutes before or um, the doctor should initiate this actually so they'll order a leuco reduced or um, washed RBCs okay um, either term will be used ex interchangeably that means they remove a lot of or most of the white blood cells in the blood sample before we transfused it uh, we'll skip mild rea allergic reaction because those are really, I mean, they're nothing. Um, they're mild, okay? Um, um, and it's simple. You just simply stop again, stop, call the doctor, and then maybe he'll give you uh, Benadryl. Uh, same thing for anaphylactic. It's not really common, so we'll skip that. So we'll only test hemolytic, uh, febrile, and this one is common circulatory overload especially in patients who are above 65 years old or those patients who receive multiple bags of blood so once patients receive two or more units of packed red blood cells they could develop this uh, these are your patient symptoms again the first action is to stop um, I know because this one didn't say stop uh, do not restart so we don't have to stop although you still have to call the doctor and then he'll probably give you uh, diuretics okay and um, maybe between units so let's say this patient receives four units so he'll say uh, all right um, give 20 milligrams of Lasix after each unit right? unless the patient really goes into severe pulmonary edema for instance or heart failure then um, we of course we cannot continue with the transfusion but uh, if caught early you know you see signs of fluid overload early the the diuretic should take care of it and you may have to transfuse the um, the blood at a slower rate than you were trans infusing it at before it happened sepsis is um, not really um, common because I mean we did a lot okay be before uh, it's not common because we we have modern um, ways now of preparing blood you know checking it for all the contamination and screening it for disorders um, that's not very likely to happen uh, including this one also trolley that's not very common this one is um, common so besides circulatory overload, any patient, again, who receives multiple blood transfusions at one time, you know, let's say they're scheduled to receive five units or four units of blood, 
um, they can suffer massive blood transfusion reaction. The problem here is citrate toxicity, which will lead to hypocalcemia, and then hyperkalemia. So these are the two major problems here. Now the, the cause of this is during storage, whoever donated the blood, you know, we don't know how long the blood has been in storage. So the blood there during storage continues to age. So some red blood cells there continue to die during storage, meaning they've outlived their life. You know, some are 100 days, let's say, when during the donation. And then 20 days later, no, they died already. So they've reached the end of the line. So they died inside the bag. So you know when cells die, they spill out potassium, right, and uric acid. Um, so that's the reason for the hyperkalemia. The reason for the citrate toxicity is we use citrate in the blood bag. So when blood is donated, the tubing and the blood itself are lined with citrate as a storage solution, meaning it will prevent deterioration and clotting of the blood during storage. So with each bag that you receive, of course you receive citrate. So the more bags of blood you receive, the more citrate you, re you receive. Now how does this lead to hypocalcemia? Well, when citrate enters your blood, it binds with calcium. So the free calcium, calcium in your blood now becomes calcium citrate. Calcium citrate as a compound is useless now in the blood. It, it cannot enter the cell because now it's a compound. Only free calcium can leave and enter the cell. Uh, once they form the compound um, calcium citrate, it now goes to the bone for deposition, leaving you with less um, free calcium levels. And that's it for... Um, those are the four uh, testable uh, transfusion reactions, just the common ones. So we have the serious, uh, although this is uncommon, however, it's the most life-threatening one. So I, I have to test it. Acute hemolytic, uh, febrile reaction, circulatory overload, and massive blood transfusion reaction. Questions again will be the signs and symptoms because you need to recognize it. Nurses are the one transfusing blood. So you have to know to recognize when it develops. And then most importantly, you have to also know what do you do once you identify it. Oh, management for this. Uh, you manage each one separately. Uh, here, um, blood warming equipment may prevent that from happening when they have that then you treat the hyperkalemia you treat the hypocalcemia so you have hypocalcemia so here's the calcium replacement so you give you replace the calcium that that was um, you know taken because calcium became calcium citrate that's it um, what else i know that should be it for chapter 30.